How about now, Lucky? Are we live? Are we live? So I don't say it yet. Yeah, no. No, yeah. Well, that's beautiful. My goodness. Always a bit of always a bit of uh of a question mark with the technology, but it looks like we're happening. People are still filing into our Zoom call. Okay, guys, so let me welcome, welcome you warmly. First of all, it's, it's actually, you know, it's my first live. So, so I'm really excited, you know, I'm really excited because this is the first time that I actually have a chance to interact with the people that I've been working really hard to mentor. I know I, I haven't been doing it individually. That would be impossible. But those of you who are inside of my masterclass know uh, or have told me that you feel a certain spirit, you know, and it's not coincidental because I've actually pictured every one of you in front of me when I was putting the masterclass together so that it could be something that you could feel some someone talking directly to you and, you know, not some kind of a teaching from above that you're not really resonating with. So. The call that we're doing today is basically happening in a way that we have a Zoom call with our masterclass students. So we have about 40 people, 39 people in the call. And then on YouTube, there are folks who, for whatever reason, have not yet been able to join the masterclass. And so both of you are going to get to basically ask me questions. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to give a brief summation of the mini course that I gave over the last two weeks. And then we're going to get into the questions and we're going to start with our masterclass students inside of the Zoom call. And then um, Lucky's going to monitor YouTube to catch some really good questions from there that we will also answer. And I want to take this opportunity right now to introduce Lucky. Lucky Bamba, who's my co-host, my moderator, and part of our Tommy Z and Co. family. Hey, so, everyone. Hey. hey. So and, nice to uh, see you. Also, a warm welcome to a few people from my family who, um, uh, when I say my family, I mean it literally. Like, my son is fascinated with YouTube. He's seven years old, and uh, he's eight years old, and uh, he said he's going to watch me tonight, so... I'm actually more nervous, I think, about my family watching than all of you guys. So hi, Julian, if you're watching. Hi, Ala, if you're watching. Hi, Kasha, my lovely wife, if you're watching. And um, yeah, so when I talk about family, I mean uh, literally. And then I mean figuratively also because I call my inner circle of people that I choose to collaborate with family and I also call all of you folks family, the people who have joined the masterclass, your extended family. And some of you I haven't met yet, but I'm sure we will have a chance to meet at some point. So welcome to all of the family. It's really nice to have you. And even though we're not in the same space, let's make the most of this, you know. So, um, yeah, let's get right into a little summation of the mini course. Uh, so basically over the last two weeks, I put out, um, yeah, what I call a mini class, but the thing actually ended up being like seven hours. I, I just don't know how to create these like internet friendly things, you know, like three tips in 15 minutes. I mean, that's not the way it works, is it? Like if you're after a proper you know, music career and being a remarkable craftsperson, like, I don't think you can get anything sorted out in less than 10 minutes, right? So let me do a quick summation and then let's jump right into the questions because I don't want to be talking. I want you to have your voice today and I want you to ask questions. So let me, let me just share my screen really quickly here and let me know if you can see this. Yeah, is everyone seeing this? Is this okay? Yeah, awesome. Okay, so let's just bring everything together that I spoke about in my mini course and also my masterclass students will be familiar with it. But if you're not a part of the masterclass, then here's kind of the main takeaways. So 2020, as of today, 
you're a general in charge of your music career and you're looking around the battlefield and what are you seeing? It's very important for you to be sober and honest and sharp when you're looking at the battlefield. It's really hard to be a general uh, in any meaningful way if you're not actually surveying the possibilities and the problems properly. So the problem today is music is not selling. Uh, people aren't buying music because they don't have to buy it. So they do a lot of streaming, but streaming royalties, everybody knows, micro pennies. I mean, it's really low, right? And now to add to the problems this year, we had a huge influx of students because tours got canceled. So a lot of people who made money off of live performances suddenly overnight were left without an income. And you've heard from some of them, like Lewis, for instance, who's a part of our family and who uh, joined the class this year because his live gigs were canceled, like suddenly. Besides the fact that he was also having a hard time picturing himself oh, right. carrying speakers in 20 years <laughs> to his live performance. But that's another thing. So that's the problem that we're facing today. And if you're honest, that, that is the problem. But we also have to acknowledge the possibility like look around everywhere you look, whether it's your smartphone, whether it's your tablet, whether it's your smart TV, you're seeing 24 hours, seven days a week of nonstop content, all of which needs sound. And so I always talk about the fact that Bach, Mozart, Handel somehow made a living making music <laughs> before there was a record industry. And they did it because they had a mindset shift, right? And this mindset shift, but they didn't have to do a mindset shift. This is just how it was back then. But for us, it's important to do kind of a mindset shift, which takes us back to Bach, which is that we have to get away from the paradigm of selling music to individual people. And we have to start thinking of selling our musical skills as craftspeople and selling those skills to places, places that need original music that fits their campaign like a glove, places that are willing to pay for it, uh, pay for this music. And so I always, you know, it's like people ask for tips and how do you get in the business and how do you, what are the seven ways and blah, 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 blah. But the reality is, is like when you want to make a living as a creative person, you have to up your sensibility, you have to up your personality, you have to up your charisma, your knowledge, your the way that people feel when you walk in the room. All of that has to be improved, developed. You have to work on that because it's not just about what kind of music you make. It's about the kind of person that you are. I'm really convinced that Hans Zimmer gets most of his gigs because of the way he talks about music. I mean, it's not as if he's wildly better than Danny Elfman or any of these Hollywood composers, but it's just that people will choose to work with Hans Zimmer because he has a certain vibe and certain film directors would be like, I just like sitting there on a, on a plush couch with Hans with his weird colored blazers and his metaphors. You know, so, so this is what I try to emphasize. And I hope that I think my masterclass students kind of know this by now. It's like, it's not just about a shortcut to be able to produce music well. It's also about developing yourself overall as a person so that you are remarkable. Literally what the word means that people remark about you when you leave the room. That today when everybody can download a splice drum loop and put a guitar on it, it's like, what is so outstanding about that? It's easy to do. So more and more, we have to focus on finding that thing that maybe is difficult to do, that is rare to do, but we have the superpower to do it, right? And so also a very important aspect of being a craftsperson is self-reliance. We have the tools, we have the technology today and things are moving really fast. So it's not like back in the day where you could take six months to record an album and then you know get a big record deal and then get a big radio promotion and then get a big distribution going and then get big sales. The paradigm has changed completely. I want you to think about your career more like 
you're not going to make a hundred thousand dollars with a home run, but you might make a thousand bucks 50 times a year producing a quick track for a social media campaign or for some brand or maybe for a local business. I mean, I don't know any musicians who would be upset at making 50 grand a year just from music. Do you? I don't know any. I mean, so self-reliance goes a big way, right? Because we have the tools. There are no more excuses. Back in the day, the problem was barriers. You didn't have the tools. You didn't know how to create that drum beat. I mean, I remember in the 90s, man, whoever had the best CD-ROM of samples won. You know, it was like they were the king or the queen because they had those special sounds. Well, today, special sounds, everybody has them. They're on splice. They're on noise. They're on every VST. And so we have to now figure out a way how to be special, right? Um, one thing we also talked about was the interview, or we, we did an interview with Lewis, who is a masterclass student. It's an incredible story. I mean, the guy basically, you know, invests money that he doesn't have to join our family. Um, and he just went through the masterclass like a very diligent student. He kept in touch with me. And then he went out there in the world and he started getting some traction, but he also started, you know, there were some disappointments along the way, like people weren't getting back to him or he created demos for music production companies and they weren't even getting back to him after he did some work for them. This is all part of the game, folks. Like, honestly, if somebody wants to be comfortable, you know, that's what a day job is for. If you really, really want to be a, selling creativity for money, unfortunately, you're going to have to deal with that kind of stuff, silence, rejection, disappointments. It's part of the game, right? Um, we also saw in that interview that making music for brands is not like some people think. It's not like making jingles or like some musicians think, oh, I'm an artist. I'm sophisticated. I can do this stuff like, you know, in my sleep. It's not true. <laughs> if you look at uh, what's going on today with brands. They're very sophisticated. They're working with the best photographers. They're working with the best film directors, best editors, best composers, best artists. Because advertising doesn't really work to move people anymore. You see, and so brands got wise to that not too long ago and said, okay, like we can't just do these goddamn jingles and these terrible commercials. We have to start infiltrating popular culture. And that's where the licensing started, right? Dealing with real artists, dealing com like actually hiring real photographers and mentioning their names, working with real artists, commissioning them, right? And so here we are today. You look at any brand campaign from Google, Nike, Adidas, um, any one of these uh, folks, and they're on the cutting edge as far as art, as far as creativity, as far as the colors, as far as the visuals, as far as the sound. And so, you know, this isn't like making jingles. This is really like elevating your game so that you become a craftsperson who's able to do the things that we observe brands doing because they are the patrons today. They literally have their finger on the pulse. Like who else has their finger on the pulse today as far as moving humans emotionally? You, you can bet it's brands. <laughs> like if anybody knows how to move humans, it's going to be brands, okay? Okay. So then in the mini course, we also talked about understanding and focusing on your audience. So as a musician, I get tons of emails every single day, man. And I want to cry. I just want to cry because of the way musicians are writing these emails. I'm like, you have no chance writing emails like this. You know, you have no chance. I get these long essays and it's like as if a person you were stuck talking to somebody and they just kept talking about themselves the, the whole time. And like when they weren't talking about themselves, they were asking you for a favor or they asking if, if you could help them. It just doesn't work in interpersonal human relationships and especially in our business because people are so busy and they're stressed a lot of times. So like a stressed person, like imagine if you're stressed and you're in the middle of the jungle, this is kind of what being like a music producer is like in our business. I'm stressed. I'm in the middle of the jungle. What I'm watching for is survival. I just want to survive this project. Of course, I want to do well, 
But first of all, I don't want to fail. I, I want to survive this project. And so what am I on the lookout for? I'm on the lookout for anything that will give me an edge. And this is why I always say to musicians, it's, it's, a, it's incredible how much timing plays a role. Never give up. Why? Because you might be sending emails for six months. It might be your 576th email that lands in the right inbox at the right time. Of course, if you wrote it just the way we teach in the masterclass. And suddenly this music producer who's stressed out and he's in the jungle and he's looking for an edge, a way out, he clicks on your link and goes, oh my goodness, that's exactly the sound that I need right now. And that's why a lot of people's careers in this business broke suddenly. Because like Sean DeVries, we talk about him, or I, I should say Sean Christopher, I actually said his real name. I should bleep it out. Sean Christopher, artist, record deal. He, uh, he's making music for brands. I work with him for a long time. A man of his talent who's able to be uh, on the same um, label as, and the name escapes me now, Jose Gonzalez. This is the kind of talent this guy has. He sent an email to music production companies and like they said, yeah, sure, whatever. I mean, imagine a guy with his talent basically got kind of a cold shoulder and he didn't hear back for a year. And then suddenly he heard back and then watch out. One thing led to another and then led to another and then led to another. And this story, I just keep repeating over and over and over again. Just because like people aren't mailing you back, it doesn't mean anything. You got to keep going because like I said, music producers are busy. They're just looking for the edge. So the problem with a lot of musicians is you email these folks who are basically stressed, they, don't, they have very little time with these long things and they don't even read them because when they see a long email, they just simply ignore or delete right away because it's not what they need right then and there, right? And so even if I'm busy and I get an email that has like three sentences or four sentences and it makes me smile, I might even unconsciously click the link. Do you see what I'm saying here? Because that's the kind of mode that we're in when we're going through emails, right? It's kind of like, you're kind of like a robot. You know, you're just flicking, 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 and something interests you, you click on it. And that's that moment when if your music is remarkable enough and your approach is remarkable enough, that email might not be enough to give you the job right then and there, but it'll be enough for that pro music producer to say, you know what? I like the way this person communicates. Everything is clean, slick, simple, like well put together. You know, it says a lot. So, so I've shown you examples and some of the guys who, um, uh, whose websites I showed are here, right? Mateo, you're here. Uh, hello and welcome to you. Uh, great mm -hmm. example of a guy who just keeps in touch with me. Like every email is full of smiles, you know. Uh, he's working really hard. Also not seeing uh, traction in the beginning and then suddenly seeing traction and I'm seeing him like jumping up and down and doing cartwheels. And, you know, I just keep repeating in the masterclass and to anybody who will listen, guys, whether you're low or whether you're high, this is an ultra marathon. A professional craftsperson doesn't get high when things are high, doesn't get low when things are low. You stay even and you just keep marching every single day. Not like an idiot with your head down, but like someone who's aware, who has their head up and constantly surveying the battlefield. What I mean by this is like, don't march with your head down and say, I've sent a thousand emails. If you're not getting any replies after 100 or 200 emails, maybe it's time to look up and pivot and adjust your approach, right? Um. Another mistake I see musicians making is that you focus too much on projects. I know you want your first project. I know you want to work with a brand. But again, it's an ultra marathon. Yeah, it might happen quickly to some people, but most of the time it really takes time, okay? And so, and also musicians tell me I hate selling. I know, I know that feeling. But the way that I got over that feeling early on in my career when my job was to bring projects to the studio or else I would get fired, is I focused on the people and not the project. When I focused on the project, I seemed tense. I seemed stiff. People who had lunch with me were like, dude, if you were just yourself, I mean, you'd do a lot better. 
instead of like sitting on the edge of your seat and like, I can see that you're, you can't wait to say, so are we going to have a chance to work together? <laughs> you know what I mean? So really look at it as like, you're trying to go out there and make some friends in the business and it will be easier for you to write those emails, to connect with people because the pressure won't be there. Okay. And I don't know who doesn't enjoy a new person in their life, as long as that person is inspiring, as long as that person brings something to your life, not hassles, not demands, not complaining, but like, you know what I mean? It's that kind of person that shows up in your email mm -hmm. inbox once in a while. Just think like, how would you like it done to you? Do you ever get emails from strangers? And which ones do you ignore? Which ones do you delete? And which ones don't rub you the wrong way, even if they are sales emails or whatever? Maybe take notice of those, put them in a folder and go, why didn't I like put this in junk or why didn't I delete this right away? It's interesting because this person clearly has an agenda, but the way they approached me, maybe I should take note of it, you know? So get inspired by things like this. And yeah, timeless sayings, guys. Routines are the remedy to roller coasters. No matter if you're high or low, you just keep marching. A uh, music career has never been easy. It's always been difficult. It's always been an ultra marathon. And I always keep repeating this 315, 60, 720. Masterclass students will know what that means. It's not about waking up one morning and going, I'm going to make it and scream out the window, I'm going to make it. And then spend two days frantically working away only to gas out after two days and go, oh, you know what? Maybe this is not for me. And that's not what pros do. So I always say 3, 15, 60, 7, 20. Email three people a day. That's it. Three people a day is 15 people a week, 60 people a month, 720 people a year. If you keep pivoting all along and noticing what's working, what's not working, double down on what works, something will happen if you email 720 people. And notice that 700 and 20 is a large number, but you don't have to think about this number. All you got to do when you wake up in the morning is think about the number three. That's all. Email three people, uh, write three hooks, score three commercials, um, whatever. Learn three things, you know? Um, and so that's basically the keys, the key takeaways that I want to share with you guys from the mini class, but even from the master class. I mean, uh, this is really just foundational stuff, but we can never get enough of this, guys. I know how it is. I know how it is because I myself struggle sometimes and I need to um, also get motivated and I need to also open my favorite books and reread certain things. Um, it's like Zig Ziglar, one of my favorite motivational speakers once said, you know, motivation is like showering. It's not enough to do it once, you know, do it every day. So, so find your, you know, some people have emailed me and said that they actually like they joined the master class. They didn't do much with it. And now they're coming back to it. And I always have a sense of empathy for people because I remember how it was when I was trying to break in the field and I still had a day job. It's like, it's not easy when you have responsibilities and things to do. And here is this big dream that you want to go after. It's not easy, right? And so you really have to keep motivating yourself every single day or else it wears off and you kind of forget about your dream. You stop doing stuff. But this is why this formula, 315, 60, 720 is so key because anyone can find time to email three people a day, okay? Or write one hook a day, which is five hooks a week, which is 20 hooks a month, which is 240 hooks a year. It's a lot, you see? So, so, so yeah, these are the key takeaways. And now I want to stop talking because, uh, yeah, I've been talking long enough. And lucky, we maybe start with the masterclass students inside the Zoom call. Yeah. If you have any brilliant questions, um, Maybe we unmute whoever asked the question and we can have a, I want to do this kind of rapid fire. Like I don't want to talk for a long time. What I'd rather do is like try to answer your question really quick and try to get as many people as possible. So like rapid fire. Yeah, we have uh, David Lowe. Um, maybe we can 
Hey, David. Ask you to unmute here. David. Um, let me Hello. See if... Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Hey, everyone. Uh, hey, hey, from hey, Canada. Hey. <laughs> Let's talk real quick. Tommy, uh, nitty gritty question right down to yeah. it. Well, I'm trying to streamline things, make things a lot faster as I work as my workflow. Yeah. When it comes to mixing, mastering, do you bounce everything to audio and mix from there, or do you combination of of, of MIDI and uh, and audio files? So different composers have different ways of doing it. I personally like to convert MIDI into audio as soon as I can, because I just MIDI scares me, especially when I'm working on a big composition. Um, for two reasons. One is like. I work very quickly. And so I add a lot of tracks. So imagine like if you have five Omnisphere tracks, seven Spitfire orchestral tracks and whatever, whatever. At some point you find it's like your computer is slowing you down. Right. And so personally, I like to convert things into audio as soon as I can, as soon as possible. And also that makes it fun for me to work with audio. So for instance, if I have a piano or a string melody that I've laid down, uh, and it's still in MIDI, once I bounce it to audio right away, I can reverse it. And I just do these things automatically. And you've seen it in, in the class. Like I will, I will like copy a one pattern three times and then do different things to it, which starts creating different textures. And so that's the main reason why I like to turn MIDI into audio. So I can reverse it, I can chop it up, I can pitch it down, I can pitch it up and start getting some really interesting effects happening. Um, as far as mixing and mastering, I get this question a lot. There is no such thing as mixing and mastering as you know it in making music for brands. So a lot of you come from a producing song writing background where all those stages are div divided. And traditionally, that's how it always was. Like you went in the studio, you recorded. So first, you needed to make sure that the recording is done right. Everything sounds great without noise, beautiful mm -hmm. signal. Then you would sit with the mixing engineer, the producer, to actually mix the things you recorded to sweeten the sound even more. And then you would take your mix over to a mastering engineer and you'd sit there and mix it. We don't do that in, in making music for brands. The music that you hear on TV or internet that's coming from big brands, it was literally done by one person, by that composer, and they mixed as they went along. And then like nobody on our end is going to mix the track the next mix that's going to happen is the broadcast mix, which means that your demo should already sound good enough as it is, this track, this score, whatever it is. And then it's going to get added to a Pro Tools session at a post-production company somewhere, a mixing fa facility, where they will record the actors, the voiceover, the narrator. They will add the sound design. And then the mixing engineer that's mixing for broadcast, he's worried about the entire soundscape, your track just being one component of it. He's not worried about the details in your track. That should already sound good. And so that's a skill that's definitely um, something that you need to keep improving at. If, if you know, because it's, it's like when I get emails from composers with the tracks, like imagine I'm listening and I go, oh my, that sounds so amazing. It's like the song itself is not separated from the mix anymore. It's not as if I get a song and go, I can't wait to mix it. You know, it, that doesn't happen. Like it, it should already sound exactly the way it's supposed to sound. I might have some feedback. I might ask for the splits or the stems to, to you know, to play around with some things. But But yeah, you should, this is something to learn. And you know, uh, we've been talking about the next steps for the master class, uh, what to do. I'm really comfortable with the master class and the intention that I had for it, like, and what it's doing. Um, because I've watched people go through it. I've seen what effect it has on people. And everything I put in there is basically the entire path, like everything you need to know. We don't go into production and mixing and things like that in detail. So for me, like the next step would not be to keep adding those things to the master class, which is going to get bloated, but like to start creating new things. You know, we've been talking maybe about a membership community where you'd have more access to 
uh, to these kind of conversations where you get to have a voice, where I get to maybe bring in my favorite mix engineer or my favorite composer, or better yet, bring in music producers from music production companies who might be ignoring your emails, but who might actually listen to your stuff on the call, you know, things like this. So, so uh, as a side note, this is what I'm thinking about in December. Like, what's the next step? And it's mostly to get your traction. And that means for, for different people, different things. So people who are, for instance, still learning how to mix and produce, we're going to create resources for that. Like how to actually help you to step up your game as far as mixing, songwriting, production. And then for people who are already ready, we're going to be looking at more contests, for instance, to connect musicians within the masterclass with real life opportunities. And by the way, um, I don't know if um, Ricardo is here, but um, remember we had that epic orchestral contest. One of our students, uh, their composition was picked. We're actually working really hard on this project right now. And it turned out really huge. It turned out bigger than we imagined uh, because when the film director received the score and he started talking to the client, he said, we're actually going to get a real orchestra to record this thing. So we're actually busy doing that right now. I can't reveal the, the campaign details, but I'm definitely going to reveal them as soon as we're done. And you're going to see a case study because again, it brought together a few uh, masterclass students, you know, uh, and, and gave them this opportunity and the results are just amazing. So, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Okay. Lucky. We have Gregory, mate. Do you want to step forward? Gregory? Yeah. Well, only my mother calls me Gregory when I'm in trouble. It's great. <laughs> You're in trouble, Gregory. Uh, what's your pet name or how do people approach uh, you? Usually either Keg or Greg. <laughs> okay. Greg Keg or Greg? Keg or Greg. Keg has a story, of course, but another time. All right. All right. What's your question, man? Hey, uh, I'm from, what's your question? I'm from Montreal. Uh, I wouldn't send oh, covers to music producers. Yeah. But I'm wondering if there's copyright issues, if we were to do covers, put them out on YouTube or on our website. Uh, are we infringing on copyright specifics? You know, because yeah. That's a kind of a tricky issue because you see that a lot of people in the music business actually uh, like uh, Han, what's his name? San Holo. I don't know if you guys know this guy. He's like an electronic uh, um, producer from Amsterdam. And I think he actually got big because he kept putting out covers. He just kept remixing like really well-known tracks in his own flavor, which was a very distinct flavor. And that's how he kind of broke through the noise and people started noticing him. Um, I doubt that he asked Outcast for rights to Miss Jackson when he did his remix. So they were like bootleg remixes. So what I would say is I'm a big fan of pragmatic action. Like, like you know, whatever it takes to, to break through the noise, you know, as long as you're not risking like anything. So if you were to write a remarkable cover of a track that's maybe well known or it doesn't have to be new, but like maybe it's in the collective consciousness and you sent it to me, I would be like, oh man, this is like an amazing idea for to redo this kind of track for a campaign. And then what might happen is like the idea might turn into actual execution from uh, whoever is able to facilitate it. So maybe it's not going to be a music producer. That's the problem because we are just cooks delivering orders. You see what I mean? This kind of idea would probably start at the agency or at the brand. Like if you approach the right agency or the right brand with the right cover and said, Hey guys, like this track and this remix, you know, is just begging to be in a campaign. Then they would actually have more power to, to, turn it into a project. Having said this, still, it's not a bad idea to reach out to music producers and attach this cover uh, to them because just by the nature of the magic of that cover, they're going to be like, man, great idea. This, this guy, I'm really going to pay attention to him. And 
if it's really good, they are going to want to share it on the next pitch they're doing that is right. So they're just going to throw it in and say, hey, yeah, we haven't talked about rights or anything, but like, listen to this thing. It's magic, right? And then heads will start thinking and an agency will go, so what would it take to license it? And then let other people worry about it, you know? Um, cool. I'm pretty hey, sure Johnny, the can I step go in? for it. Sorry. If, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Greg, uh, I guess, so I get, in a more practical sense, like uh, you would mostly run into problems uh, uh, just posting cover songs if you're looking to monetize the cover songs sure. that you make, right? So as long as if you're doing it like without like monetization, you should be fine. Um, that like, sorry, I just wanted to throw that. No in. worries. If people are wondering whose voice this is, this is Mateus. Maybe you've seen him from a success story. He actually helped me produce a campaign for Google a couple of months back. And he's also hard at work now. Um, dealing with orchestration for this score, for this epic orchestral score, which a live orchestra or a real orchestra is performing. So Mateus has to get up at 5 a.m. tomorrow to yep. oversee the session on Zoom. So I have to be at the session at 5 a.m. You have to be <laughs> get at the up session. a little earlier than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But guys, uh, Mateus, thanks, thanks for speaking up because here's, uh, Mateus is another person who's actually not like a composer, like, uh, yeah, he does some stuff, but like he joined the master class as a really skilled violin player. He's actually a doctor of music, so he's got a certain superpower, but like he's not, you know, he's not going to be considered a, a top composer in consideration to create an original score for a campaign, despite all of his musical background. And yet, because he expressed his very niche and unique superpower, made it clear to me. And then suddenly I had these projects that actually I, I haven't done this kind of stuff like in a long time. And suddenly I get two projects in a row that need orchestral stuff. And what do I do? It's like, yeah, I have a bunch of people in my roster, but I'm trying to hook people up in the masterclass first. And there we go. It's like his second project that, you know, he's actually applying his very niche skills to an industry that you wouldn't consider, which is like, yeah, making music for brands. So that's also a lesson that I want to share with you because I'm inspired by, by it. And you guys should be too, you know, that uh, no matter what your superpower is, if you're able to connect it with this industry, then you're going to find yourself some work. Uh, Lucky, what else we got going on there? In Thanks, the everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you, Greg. Um, so on YouTube, we have people saying hi from many places. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. By the way, everyone on YouTube, I'm gonna get to you guys. You know, it's like we wanna we wanna deal with the uh, the family first. First, we talk to mom, grandma. Then we talk to the cousins. Um, so, but I'm definitely gonna get to the cousins. So we're gonna get to YouTube very soon with questions. And we have Shole Bergman from YouTube. A quick question: If you are in Germany, and of course. You want to address that? Where are you based? Where am I based? So I basically spend uh, 22 years of my life in Toronto. Then I lived in Amsterdam for five years. And then three years ago, I decided to go to the country where I was born, which is Poland. So right now I basically, um, it's between Poland and Toronto most of the time for me. Um, lately with this situation that the world is going through, you know, it's like I'm more remote than I am traveling. But before this year, I was doing a lot of traveling, actually. So, Amazing. but yeah, Poland. <laughs> um, we have Polish power. Ivo, Ivo Thiemann from um, The Family. Yes. Who has a question Ivo, about structuring stuff. Amsterdam, That's... right? Netherlands? Uh, Germany, actually. Oh, you're Germany. I thought, yeah, wow, I, why did I think you're from uh from uh, not sure. Okay. I'm actually close to the Netherlands border, so uh, I'm based in Bonn, okay. which is, yeah, it's kind of close. I think the reason is because I know an Evo in Amsterdam, and so I just assume okay. that, is yeah. Evo a German or a Dutch name? To be honest, I think it comes from Eastern Europe. People always think, ah, oh, I must be somewhere from Either, okay. like the Eastern part, but actually I grew up here in Germany, so. Nice, yeah. okay. Well, Evo, you're a really talented dude, like... 
I've heard your homework. You, you know, you. you're a, you're a crafts person, so it's good to see you. What what do you want to ask? Well, to be honest, when I was um, kind of thinking about a question to ask, it was overwhelming because basically all the answers are in the masterclass. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was Thanks, tricky man. to think about a question. Yeah. But I was just curious about um, structuring the day, like just a casual day, because that's uh, where, where I run into trouble sometimes. Like, Yeah, I love that a, question. A lot of stuff to do. And then I have some some way of, of organizing my day and, um, for example, the Google Calendar. But I was yeah. curious how you go about it. Like, what what's your way? How? Um... Yeah, I love that question because I'm a big fan of, like, you know, engineering, um, uh, not just productivity, but, like, you know, engineering a life that you're happy with, basically, you know. So my day is that... I try to do what is uh, important, but not urgent in the mornings. And maybe you guys have heard of this matrix. It's called the Eisenhower matrix. It's based on a past US president. Um, I don't want to go into the matrix right now, but basically there are things that you want to do that are important, but they're not urgent. And they might be, for instance, getting better at composing music. Like it's not exactly urgent, Like nobody's, you know, asking you to do that by tomorrow, but it is important. The problem is, is if you leave anything that is urgent, but not important until later in the day and take care of your urgent stuff first, there's a good chance you're never going to get to the good stuff, to the stuff that's really close to your heart, the stuff that's important for you. So my rule is I try to like until noon is when I work on the things that will flower eventually and bloom into something much bigger and much more substantial and something that's close to me. So for instance, making music for brands is not something that fires me up. And I've said this already, like I've done, you know, I've done a lot of it. And when I look at my future, I'm like, am I gonna still keep making commercials in 10 years? That's not what I see for myself. And so this masterclass started as a small seed. Nobody was waiting for it. Nobody cared. And I had to do that work very early in the morning before I get to other things, like actually producing projects that that have deadlines. So I find that my brain is freshest in the morning. So before noon, work on creative projects. Uh, That's a rule for me. Um, I don't take meetings in the morning unless they are critical. Um, Unless I'm working on a project that's, you know, for the music production company and I don't really have a choice, but as much as possible, I try not to do calls. I try not to do meetings before noon. And so then at noon, I, um, okay. So let me tell you my like perfect day. And I, I made a video about this on YouTube, but The first thing I will do is roll out of bed and into my jogging pants and running shoes. And I'll do like slow jogging for five kilometers, slow jogging guys. Like you could pass me walking. So like, don't think I'm some kind of a, yeah, athlete or no slow jogging. Some Japanese guy invented this thing. And apparently it's really good for you because it doesn't put your body into stress. It's, um, It releases all the hormones in your brain that make you feel positive, good, healthy, all that stuff. Uh, And it doesn't burn you out, which means that you could do 5K every single day, which means you do like 25K a week. Yeah, you're running like a turtle and people might be passing you. But the point is, is you're still getting your heart rate up faster than just walking, right? So that's the first thing I do. Then drop off kids at school, then breakfast. Then, uh, and while I eat breakfast, by the way, also, I do not eat any junk food on my phone. Like no YouTubes, no garbage, no uh, Facebooks, no, nothing fast food E like in my feeds. Um, I only allow myself to do that in the evening when my brain is already shutting down and I'm more in consumption mode, but I'm trying not to get influenced already and like, have my attention split first thing in the morning. So eat breakfast, I read my favorite news sources or I'll read an ebook or whatever. 
then to the studio and in the studio, like, I don't want to open my email. I want to get to something really important to me, maybe like a new module in the masterclass or whatever before noon, then at noon, I will go for a walk, eat something healthy while I eat lunch. That's the first time I will allow myself a little bit of like entertainment in my newsfeed. So I might watch a YouTube video or whatever. And then after that, I check all my emails um, and I basically process the ones that I can process in less than two minutes. And those that I cannot, I schedule uh, to do later. It's like a quick email scan. I want to do emails like twice a day. It doesn't always work out, but especially when I'm working on a project. And then in the afternoon, I normally work on the things that um, don't require as much fresh energy. You know, those things that you have to do that you don't really have to think about, like bookkeeping or following up with someone or like, you know, whatever doesn't require that fresh creative energy. So I'll do that after lunch. Uh, I try to do a seven minute workout. Look that up. It's revolutionary, man. Seven minute workout. You use nothing but your body weight. And, you know, that's what keeps I me feeling. I do those too. Sorry. Yeah, they're excellent. Uh, they've done studies on them and they say it really is healthy for you. And it's seven minutes and it will have you tired. Trust me, because like you don't rest really. You have 10 seconds per uh, between exercises, 12 exercises. Uh, I find when I'm doing it, I'm better. I'm better. I'm sharper. I'm more positive. I'm less. Um, yeah, man, like body and mind connection is so strong, you know, because when you're feeling down, it's it's like a physical thing. It's like you sit differently. It's like you 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 slump your shoulders. It's like you're walking around with your head down. But when you're feeling vital and energetic and you you're kind of confident that um, because you've been doing it every day. So you can tell yourself, well, I consider myself in pretty good shape because I've been doing this every day. And it's only seven minutes. It's like you walk differently. You know, you, you talk differently, you have more energy. All of those things are connected. You know, uh, they will affect also your outreach, the way you email people. You know, it's really crazy how emails can carry a certain energy. Um, and then uh, after that, I try to do a long walk and audiobook every day. Like, so what I will do is, uh, after the kind of like two hours of menial work by 3 PM, I'm ready to, to do something else again. So I will leave the studio, put on my favorite audiobook, and walk to a cafe. That's like one kilometer away. And I just listen to the audiobook, get inspired then walk back with my coffee. Uh, and then, and then I usually do meetings anywhere between like three 30 and six. I will do meetings uh, because that's when it's like, I'm still feeling, I'm not feeling fresh creatively, but you know, who knows, like a good meeting, good conversation uh, is important to build relationships anyway, that kind of naturally brings up your energy. So, and then I try to be home at six, although lately it hasn't been working, you know, it's like, man, I'm getting home uh, usually like 7 PM and, you know, I've been, uh, talking to a few friends of mine who are like, dude, you gotta, you know, you gotta watch that. You gotta watch that because right now we're trying to run the music production company and the masterclass. The numbers are increasing. Things are happening on both ends. And, uh, you know, I'm a sensitive guy. Like I don't like people with like leaving people without an answer. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm really trying to anyone that's been in touch with me knows like I'm, 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 I'm trying to put my heart into this and not leave you hanging, but yeah, it's, it's like, we we're going to think about ways in December to like, you know, create efficiencies, which allow us to keep serving you and keep uh, giving you value and traction. But uh, yeah, so I don't lose myself in the process and get burnt out. Evo, that's a long, I mean, man, I feel like wow. I talk too much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Really Thanks. helpful. Yeah. Okay. I promise. Uh, rapid fire now. We have uh, Chris Simpson now. Hey, that? thanks for, uh, hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was wondering if you have, uh, you kind of answered this earlier um, with what your future plans are, but I was wondering what, uh, if you have any, uh, prefer tutorials for music theory or like uh, synth patch design um, any anywhere where you go where you find inspiration 
Yeah. I'm, um, maybe I'm not the right person to ask for this because it's funny. Like, even though I've made music for big brand campaigns, I've never actually been classically trained and I've never seriously taken the time to learn music theory. It's like, Every time I start, it's like, I just got to make some music for something that has a deadline. So I just go and do it, you know? So it's one of those things. Um, but the, the, the people that I enjoy watching, uh, for instance, is like uh, Rick Beato, Rick Beato on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like his stuff, but I wonder, like, is there anyone else on this call? Lewis, you're here. Uh, you got resources that, that helped you with songwriting or music theory or, or production? I, I took it a, a one, a two semesters of it in college and it, it's been extremely helpful, but I think uh, Mateus might be a better, he might have more an idea than I do. <laughs> well, Mateus has a doctorate in musical arts. We right. But I mean, I think like, he just, we need someone below his level. <laughs> No, but yeah. because he does, because he's knowledgeable, but I thought maybe he might know some channels because I don't. Could be. Mateus, what do you got? I don't know a single channel of music theory. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I, I already had so much training in school. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, I also, I, I feel like I love music theory in general. So I'm also biased. But like yeah. there are like a lot of videos on YouTube. I see some of them like once in a while. I just don't remember like the channel names. Like, and people will do like you know those like fast drawing kind of videos. You know, where yeah. they're like writing the music and then explaining. Yeah. Um, some of them you are know, really really good. You know what I would say? I also want to hear from one more person, uh, Ricardo. Say hello. Uh, yeah. So Ricardo, uh, I just met recently because he's the guy whose composition was picked in the Epic Orchestral score. And so now <laughs> it's like we went from a handshake to like, you know, running the treadmill, like um, actually working and trying to meet deadlines and uh, it totally different relationship. But I know you're a music teacher, uh, Ricardo. Like, do you have any good tips or resources for practical there's a, um, a lot of things on YouTube and, uh, but a specific channel, I really can suggest one. Um, I, um, I saw what Matthias says about this fast drawing music. And this is, this was cool. This was a cool, this was a cool channel, for, but I don't remember the name. Uh, I really don't. Okay, I have a I have a couple of tips for you guys. But but maybe I don't know if uh, YouTube could could be um, the right place. You know, yeah. there's a lot of stuff and good things and bad things at the same time. Yeah, uh, there is. Uh, let me see. Uh, holistic songwriting. So that's uh, Freedom in Findesine. Uh, holistic songwriting. Look him up on YouTube. I've had a chat with him and he's a really cool guy. I think I did an interview or like a, a bit of a chat on this channel. He's a very, uh, I like him because he's concrete, like he makes good stuff happen. So, um, but I haven't gone through it, so I couldn't tell you, but let me tell you how I try to improve my production practically. So it's not about music theory for me, what it is about for me is like, I pay attention to things that make me feel a certain way. Say I'm watching HBO, say I'm watching Netflix, say I'm watching a commercial. And suddenly there's a chord progression, which is, oh my goodness. It just opens things up. It just takes you to a different place. And you're like, wow, how did they do that? And then what I do is I literally try to find that damn piece of music I drag it into my Ableton and I will literally create harmony. You can right click in Ableton and create a melody or harmony in MIDI from it. And I so do that over, as well. Yeah. And so I have in my Ableton now a library of chord progressions, which I yeah. basically copy from like religiously. And it doesn't matter. You know, a chord progression is not something that, uh, you know. I do the same. I do the same, but with paper. 
with paper. <laughs> okay. Because yes, you, you're, you know, I wrote down the, the progression yeah. I love yeah. and, and yeah. I, uh, sorry for my English guys. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I wrote the, the feelings of that progression, you know, you know oh, what I mean? Okay. Yeah. That's how I um, name my progressions too. Like, yeah, I actually put like, Yes, uh, and I got a bunch of progression yeah, yeah. for sadness and a bunch of progression yeah. for yeah. Uh, this joyful. is a good tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good one. So I'm practical about it. Um, here, Pascal is saying for mixing, mastering pure mix is super interesting. A lot of resources. Uh, I remember Lewis mentioning in our interview uh, Slate that they have a for members. I guess they have a lot of resources for production. Yeah, they do, but it's it's all production. You're not really going to see anything about theory. Okay, study uh, things. Um, study the masters, like really study the, you know, take Band of Brothers on on Spotify and listen to that soundtrack and understand what Band of Brothers is doing musically, and and try to like translate that into MIDI, and then um, try it with your favorite synths. What I will do is literally take like. Uh, chorales from Bach and uh, there's a tool from um, this guy um, Steve Duda Steven Duda I don't know if you guys heard of him but he's behind the serum synthesizer and he has this thing called I don't even know how to pronounce it but it's like um, it's from a film I think it's spelled like C-T-H-U-L-H-U -H -H see if I can C T H U L H U. Anybody knows how to pronounce this thing? Yeah, that's uh, Cthulhu. Cthulhu. Okay. So there's a plugin called Cthulhu, which is kind <coughs> of like an arpeggiator and a and um yeah, and it like an accord generator. And within uh this thing, there's presets from like all these classical pieces, including back chorales, like 99 back chorales. So what I, what I will do is actually like go through the presets. And every key on your keyboard will then be like a chord from the chorale. So what I love to do is actually connect those chords with like a modern sounding instrument. I, I know this is a trick for Dead Mouse because I've heard him talking <laughs> about it. That's how they used to do it. It's like Steve and, and Dead Mouse used to sit there and probably extract chords from classical compositions. Because, you know, a classical composition will go through like seven things that don't repeat in one measure. But in electronic music, you will just take three of those chords and they'll be deeper and like richer and they'll just give you an incredible feeling. So, so I would study mm. things that way, you know, just drag them into your DAW, try to turn them into MIDI and collect those moments and then use them in your compositions. Lucky, I feel like we should move on to our, uh, let's do a few more rapid fire yeah, if anyone in the room has a question, and then and then we go on to YouTube uh, questions. Okay, we have Omar. Um, I'm gonna mute you now. Omar Ben Hassan. Omar. Okay. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, man. We can yes. hear you. We can Happy see days. You. Hi, Omar. I'm from Belfast. Uh, Northern Ireland, how's it going? Um, yeah, it was uh, it was a bit back now the question, um, but basically I was I was sort of saying about when you're doing the reel, okay, and you were you were mentioning basically about different like music houses would come and listen to your reel, but if you happen to have, you know, a varying amount of style of songs, how do you kind of tailor your 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 reel each time to kind of yield better results? So that you're not kind of wasting their time, you know, by getting, you know, do, do you know what I mean? What I would recommend is like, I mean, ideally you have one reel that represents who you are and you have a certain sound. Um, what you could do is like tailor what you show to different music production companies, depending on what you see on their website. Mm -hmm. So what I might do if I was starting today is I like I would go to these music production company websites, check out what are they featuring in their reel, and then create something like it, maybe with a twist, you know? Okay. Um, your, your own twist, yeah. Yeah, with your own yeah. twist. But, but make sure that this twist is still something that is 
that has a chance to resonate in the commercial world. So it's not like, you know, yeah, my twist is making stuff really avant-garde. <laughs> That's great. But, you know, yeah. it's probably not going to find a home on a commercial campaign. So, so I would, you know, when I, for instance, meet with uh, brand people or agency people, I do my research on them. Like um, when I was presenting to like chief marketing officers of brands, I would literally have like interns re like following these guys around where they speak. Did they have an interview lately? Every appearance they've made, I study it and I try to listen to what they're saying, what their values are, what their philosophy is. And then I'm in a meeting with them and I'm like, you know, I really believe in working in, 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 in measuring um, one. No, how do you say it? Like, let's say uh, some kind of a quote, right? That they use. So measure twice, cut once. That's the quote. So let's say I, I bring that up in a meeting, like I'm talking or whatever, you know, and I say, I, I believe in measuring twice, cutting once. They'll be like, yeah, me too. You know, it's like, they don't realize, dude, I've been researching you for two weeks. So I already know how this conversation is going to go. You see? And they're thinking, oh, we're on the same wavelength. Well, we could very well be, but like, I don't leave that to chance. So the answer to your question is like, research who you're going to connect with and see if there's a little flavor that you can find, see if there's something you can do about your reel that will especially uh, resonate with them. You know, so that's what I would say. Helpful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Amazing. No worries. We have Sebastian now uh, asking about the Epic Orchestra. Um, yeah. Sebastian. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hey, Sebastian. Hello. Um, before I will ask my question, I would like to add something uh, related to this uh, um, resources on, on YouTube related to um, music theory and, and so on. Uh, I like to watch videos from uh, Alex Mukala, uh, he is a guy oh, yeah. create, creating uh, uh, orchestral uh, music. And uh, second one, second channel is from Guy Michelmore. I will put those names in the yeah. in the chat. Yeah. Uh, this guy is like uh, well, very cool videos. And if you would like to to learn some uh, well basic musical music theory, and then this is a, a, a place. Yeah, so. yeah, we might, you might, uh, people in my masterclass, you might see Guy at some point in our masterclass because we've been chatting with him and um, we're planning to do some things together, which would be really cool. We're just trying to find the right time for it. But I, yeah, he's refreshing. I love that guy. What's, uh, what question do you have, Sebastian? Yeah, okay. So I have a question about uh, Epic Orchestral Music uh, yeah. or even trailer music. Yeah. Uh, how often this kind of music is used in, in commercials? And uh, if a person creating this kind of music can make a living this way? I think so. Uh, so, I'll, you know, because it's hard for me to estimate like how much epic orchestral music is going on in the world right now. It's hard for me to estimate. So the best way I can answer your question is, do I know anyone who does nothing but epic orchestral music and are they surviving? And the answer is yes. I know somebody like this. Um, they live in, in Netherlands. Um, I've worked with them on countless huge orchestral scores. Um, and that's all they do. And they're known as that person. And they're not just doing commercials. They're also doing films. Uh, and TV series. So, yeah, the the answer is definitely yes. I've seen it. I know of of a man who's doing it right now. Uh, he bought himself a big house doing this. He has a very impressive studio. Uh, he's just like one of you guys, in in a sense, like in a sense that he's not anyone extraordinary. But what he was able to do is really learn better than anybody else how to create real sounding orchestral music with incredible force using nothing but VSTs. 
So he had this crazy setup in his house where it's like all these processing units and things like that. And he was, you know, he's a guy who got stressed easily because he cared about quality and people were always asking him to do impossible things. And he's a very pure, like very much a purist when it comes to sound. And so, um, yeah, he's like every time I speak to him, he's worried, you know, because it's like, oh, I, I don't know how I'm going to support myself. But yeah, he has a mortgage. He has a house. As far as I know, he's feeding his family. So I don't doubt for a second that big orchestral, epic orchestral, if you do it well, um, yeah, you're going to have a hard time finding projects. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. And and uh, as uh, Ivo said before, it is very hard to to create some questions to your masterclass because everything is in there, you know, <laughs> every information. So, <laughs> but so we're yeah. just here to hang out. We're just here to 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 meet each other. And you know what? I enjoy it. You know, it's like I never wanted to make it a a regular thing when I started the masterclass because I felt like I want to commit my time very carefully so that everything that we do actually verifies itself as being useful to people, you know, but uh, do I enjoy this kind of in interaction? Of course I do. So I also want to going forward, uh, figure out how to make it, you know, a more of a regular thing uh, because the masterclass, like you said, I built it, I designed it so that it has every damn answer in there, like step by step. Uh, but questions still come up, you know, and it's not just questions. It's also like motivation and it's like being a part of a community All those things are, are helpful uh, to keep you yourself motivated and, and stuff like that. Lucky, let's uh, ask some, let's get some YouTube um, questions. Well, we have, um, we have contemporary music OL who's asking about um, how do royalties work in this business? I'm, I'm guessing it's about like the back end of, or if it is like a buyout or. I don't yeah, know, it's a good yeah. question. Um, yeah. And I get this question a lot. So royalties will work differently depending on where you are in the world. So if you are in North America, you can probably forget about royalties because um, a lot of stuff there is just bought outright, basically, all down the chain. So the agency is trying to get the music from the music production company. The brand is trying to get the music from the agency. And so normally in North America, you will get paid a demo fee and a final fee. And that'll be it. Um, there might be cases if you belong to a U musician's union, American Federation of Musicians, where you might have a deal with the music production company that some of your payment is given to you in, in credits from uh, American Federation of Musicians. If you're in North America and you're a multimedia composer making music for ads, you need to be a part of American Federation of Musicians because sometimes you might get uh, paid through that. And if, if that's the case, then when the commercial renews, you might get uh, some money again if the campaign renews. But royalties, I, you know, as far as I know, um, that's more of a case in Europe. So places like Germany, places like Netherlands, uh, I'm not sure about the UK, but uh, yeah, Eastern Europe is a bit worse when it comes to royalties, but Western Europe is quite good when it comes to royalties. Um, the south of Europe is okay, not so great. Um, so, so yeah, everything depends on the deal you have with the music production company. And I know that if you work with a music production company in Western Europe, they might put it on the table. They might be like, maybe we pay you less in the final fee, but you will make royalties. So, you know, a Schwarzkopf shampoo guys in Germany running for a year straight with terrible music makes the composer rich. Maybe not rich, but like we're talking possibly six figures in royalties for terrible music. <laughs> so so it is a factor, but yeah, places like Asia, not so much. North America, not so much. Western Europe, I mean, yeah. Good that you don't mention South America, I understand. South America probably, I don't know much about, you know. We're thinking about, uh, yeah, we're doing some research about South America, maybe research, doing some outreach there and seeing if projects could come from there. But um, 
I'm not really familiar with with the industry there, but yeah, I'm sure it's not as you know uh, lucrative. Let me put it that way as as the major places like Western Europe and and uh, yeah, places like London, New York, all these you know capitals of advertising. What else we got on YouTube, Lucky? We have Yunam asking, well, I guess we already spoke about this, but um, like how, how important is music theory or, or if without it, you can already work in the you business? You can absolutely work without music theory. Absolutely. The only thing I'm going to say is all that matters is what comes out of the speaker. Like, like that's just remember that all that matters is what's coming out of the speaker. Anybody else that tells you otherwise they have no idea what they're talking about because I work with really well-educated musicians who will tell me the same thing. Cause I always ask, I always make a point of asking some of the composers I work with Finnish conservatory and they're just geniuses. Like when I watch them work, you know, on a composition, like they know, man, like from this chord, you can go to seven different places they already know. And a guy like me is trying to find my way around the keyboard. So it takes me a lot longer. But he says to me, yeah, but you know what? Music education holds a lot of people back because then they just kind of like get schematic with, with stuff. They don't have those accidents. They don't try to, you know, um, uh, get outside of the scheme. They get stuck in, in the way of doing things in a certain way of doing things. And that's not all classically trained musicians. I don't want to say that. The uh, pinnacle is when you're classically trained, but you're also like just great at breaking the rules and you're just able to answer a creative challenge. Um, so anyone listening to this who doesn't have music theory, I have zero music theory. I majored in political science in university um, my musical education came from records being played at home by my dad, uh, me being fascinated with sound and music, being a DJ all through university, then getting into music production and just making stuff, uh, that moves other human beings. So, so, uh, don't ever think that you cannot participate in this business meaningfully, uh, without music education. When Can I, I make a quick analogy, Tommy? Yes, and this is Dr. Sosa. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I need to give my two cents about music theory. Yes, but um, so uh, I one of my favorite analogies about music theory is like it, it in a lot of ways it, it behaves very much like biology, like in a, in a way that like you can study biology a lot and it will learn like the names of like every single plant or every single like cell or, or things like that. But um, knowing all of those things uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you can survive in the jungle by yourself, if that makes sense. So um, it's, it's like, so if you, if you learn all of the names, it means that you can recall things quickly. It, it's just kind of like what Tommy was saying. It was just like, oh, I know that if I'm in this court, I can go to here or here or here or here very quickly. Uh, but you can also just let your ears guide you, you know, at the same way that like any person who has no biology uh, credentials can survive in the jungle. Let's say if like, they're like a you know uh, Native American, Native Brazilian, or whatever you know person. Um, anyway, just wanted to make that little comment. Yeah, I would say that um, music, like the most important thing, is music taste. So ability to discern between something that is good, something that could be better. You know, something that's like world class and also an ability to make that like just remember that before back in the day, we literally had to learn music theory because how else would you explain to a musician how to play your stuff? But today you can write the score in your piano roll as MIDI. Right. And you instantly hear it. So, you know exactly what's going on. So. For me, the biggest skill to work on would be get really good at creating emotions uh, by practicing, by reverse engineering famous works that made people uh, feel a certain way and just keep creating stuff. Keep getting better at your sounds. Um, um, 
Yeah, because like no amount of music theory is going to help you to, for instance, create a track that gives me goosebumps. So, you know, music theory. So you understand chord progressions. Great. But, you know, now you got to actually translate them into the right sound. And that's where a lot of people I notice just go off and they go, they, they just, they just fail there because like their sounds are not up to par. They can't even tell that their sounds are not up to par. They think those sounds are good, but I don't know what they're comparing them to. So that's something to work on. Also, it's like develop a world-class taste, like a great chef, be able to understand what makes a great dish and then learn to cook by cooking it, not by reading the recipe, but by cooking it, you know, and it's going to sound bad at first, but I promise you, if you keep cooking stuff and your music taste is good, I, I, I haven't seen a lot of people who don't improve, like who just stay stuck in, a, you know, in one place. Lucky, we got any I, other good? Uh, uh, tell me, I have yeah. a question. Yeah. I, I, I have a question uh, to see if, if you have re recognized some sort of like trending, like lately this year, like a music trend on the projects that you receive. Like what, what is the tendency to agencies to request I'm not, a good, music? I'm not a good example to ask because I mostly work with people who send me more of the kind of things that I already do. Do you see what I mean? So, um, so I think a good person to ask would actually be like a composer, a freelance composer, uh, like a Naren, for instance, and because he's working with like 30 music houses. So he will, you know, because he's working on stuff every single day, he sees the patterns in the music. Um, but like recently I had an interview with, uh, um, with um, Asha Ivanovich on the YouTube channel. She's also in a masterclass. And she said, you know, uh, what's her name? Billie Eilish was the thing for, for a while, you know? But it's, it's so broad. Like there isn't just one thing. Think about it. Like the spectrum of the different kinds of sounds is so broad in advertising and multimedia. Like it's so broad, man. You literally have everything from like amazing urban hip hop stuff to like incredible electronic orchestral to like goosebump vintage rock like to jazz you know like sophisticated jazz think nespresso and george clooney they had this kind of like really sultry r&b jazzy sort of a thing going so that's the exciting part about this world is like because the music is meant to move people there are different demographics we're going to see all kinds of briefs right so um lucky we have, a, we have an interesting question for yeah. uh from brian uh so you're you're unmuted now yeah okay yeah. um can you hear me okay mm -hmm. okay um i'm gonna try and remember my connection got a little spotty and i lost yeah. everything it, it so, was about if you have any tips about how to be honest about your own work which is okay yeah thank you um first of all tommy it's great to meet you i feel like i already know you just from the master class i feel like i already know you in person but thanks brother um anyway how do you keep yourself honest about your work i mean it's real easy to get excited about a piece of music you just created you got it mixed yeah. it sounds good um but how do you keep it honest and you turn it in does that uh, make sense yeah uh a few ways that come to mind immediately uh, is AB, AB or stuff. Always AB. Like, so like, uh, you know, if you're working on homework in the master class, um, AB it with what went final and understand like, what is the difference between this and that? Your thing doesn't have to be the same, but it has to share certain elements, like a certain sound quality, a certain mix quality, a certain compositional variety a certain evolution. And so A, B stuff uh, all day, take things that impress you, put them side by side against your stuff and become almost like, like just nerd out on like, why is their mix sounding so open and wide and mine is so contained and like claustrophobic? What is it about, you know, 
just try to reverse engineer. Like the first step really to, to getting honest about your stuff is being able to like and reverse engineer even on paper a difference between your track and another track because it teaches you to listen and to come up with a bunch of things that are different and to notice them in the first place. Um, so that's, that's the first thing in our business, you know, it's kind of funny. Like I send compositions that I've done that I'm really thinking, wow, man, I did exactly what the film director asked. And then because they don't know which track is mine, they, you know, they don't, they're not nice about it. They're like, no, that was really flat. And so I still get surprised to this day by me thinking, oh, I thought that was really dynamic. And they're like, no, it's really flat. Now, they might not mean it's flat, but that's the problem with language of music is like, sometimes you have to interpret what the client is saying. Like, what do they mean by flat? You know, maybe it's something else, but um, share your music with people who you know are really good at music and who will not sugarcoat. You know, like the difference between a craftsperson and a hobbyist is that you want to expose yourself to pain. You know, think of an old man or think of an old woman with beat up hands in a workshop. Like people think it's like a joy to be a craftsperson. I, I almost think it's not like I almost think it's like a pain in a way. It's just like something you cannot not do. You know, uh, I, I heard recently that uh, Michelangelo sculpted, started 40 sculptures, uh, sculptures and finished 14 in his whole lifetime. 14. For, he started 40. I cannot imagine the, his inner state, the pressure, because he was so hell bent on perfection, you know. So, like, that's why a lot of people won't make it, you know, because it's almost like, Music is fun for them. And don't get me wrong. I want music to be fun for us, but it's also okay when it's not because I chose to be a professional craftsperson. So if it hurts, it's got to hurt. How else do you grow your muscle in the gym? By not hurting? Anything that will grow you has to hurt. So I would encourage you to like get in the habit of like reach out to someone who you probably wouldn't reach out to because they're not fun to be around. <laughs> Mm. but they're really good. Like they're masters at sound or whatever. And just go, I'm trying to do this. Like, what, what would you say about it? Am I, you know, what would you say? And then let them lay it on you and thank them for inflicting pain on you. Because um, if you use it right, um, it will turn into something great. I don't know if you guys know, but the word passion actually means suffering. Something to keep in mind for all of you aspiring musicians who are facing difficulties today. I think uh, that's what got me a little nervous. And like when I said in my email that I sent you the other day, um, where I felt like I was possibly getting in over my head on this, because for the last 30 years, that's what I've been as a hobbyist. And and when I saw the caliber of work just in the in the master class, I'm like, Man, I'm gonna really have to step up my game here. So, um, yeah, when good. I when I started the homework, I was like, "This has got to be top notch." Yeah, and you know what? In the master class, you there are all kinds of people here. There are people who uh, are just starting to like make music, and it's wonderful. I'm glad they actually joined because I think they will get a lot out of this master class anyway, even though they're not ready yet to reach out to the industry. They have a set standard to aim for. Uh, and then there are people who are quite advanced at music production. Either way, you should always feel like, man, I might be in over my head. I feel that way every time I get a project. Like, uh, you know, Mateus is going to be up at 5 a.m. tomorrow as we record a live orchestra, making sure that Ricardo's score is actually, uh, you know, being brought to life by these musicians. Um, I don't even know where I'm going with that. I lost my train of thought, but uh, 
Well, it's a relief to hear you say that even you feel like you get in over your head at times. Yes, You've been doing that's this. Where a while, I was going. So. That's where I was going. I was going in that when uh, I just solve one problem at a time. So <laughs> it's it's my taste and my uh, my experience that allows me to uh, understand that even when I feel that I'm in over my head, every problem can be solved as long as you know I'm, I commit like a true craftsperson. I commit. And um, yeah, I put all my resources, all my mental ram toward that, but I don't have to figure everything out. I just have to figure out what's in front of me. Um, and also knowing great people helps. So like, you know, knowing Mateus, um, <laughs> that helped, you know, I would not be able to sit there tomorrow with the orchestra. I'm like a Rick Rubin. I have no idea what's going on. I'm just like a guy with, you know, who's laying on the couch and going, yeah, this works or it doesn't work. That's um, their loss. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, but um, um, I think every craftsperson, even artists on top of their game, like by definition, if you feel that you've already mastered it, that you're comfortable, think how damaging that is to your creative output. Like, how could you ever feel comfortable? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what a day job is for. And for all of you guys or girls working a day job, I am not going to denigrate it. Like, it might be an essential thing to keep doing while you're improving your craft. I did things in parallel for a long time to get my craft up to a certain level. I was able to leave my day job when the right opportunity came and I already had a certain experience. But like, don't, um, what I want to say is like, your day job is for feeling comfortable. When you step in the studio, you know what I mean? It's like, if you, if you really aspire to be a craftsperson, uh, it's, gotta, it's always got to be a bit of a pressure. It's always got to be a bit of a pressure. It can't go too far either. Because then you deflate yourself, then you stop showing up. Remember, I told you about slow jogging. The reason mm -hmm. why I do slow jogging is so I do it again. If I ran like other people do, I would probably not run at all because it would hurt too much. So so it's a balance, you know? It's a balance. Lucky, what do you got there? So we, we have a lot of questions from both hands. I don't know if we will reach all that. Now we have... Uh, uh, yeah, we probably Fiona. won't. And I'm sorry in advance to all. To all. We, we have Fiona next. Um, was already. Hi. Yeah, Fiona. Hey, Fiona. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you and see you. How you Hi. doing? Hi, great meeting you. I really like mm -hmm. your math class. Thank you so much. Um, so my question is, because you talk a lot about routine, which I really uh, appreciate, but how do you take scheduled breaks without the fear of losing your vibe or idea? Um, there's two schools of thought. So I heard one author say that uh, he will actually finish right at the moment when he's having the best time. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he will know that he can pick up the next day right from there. Mm hmm uh, so that's one school of thought. I find that difficult, to be honest. So if I feel like the inspiration is, is going, like it's there, I tend to respect that. And I tend to just go until I feel like I'm stuck in a loop again. The moment I'm stuck in a loop again, uh, I try to shut off the doll if I have time so I can re pick it up the next day so I don't get too deflated or, or whatever. So two schools of thought, I think you have to tailor it to your own, um, to your own um, style. But the one thing about rituals is that you will find yourself a lot more productive and inspired the more you sit down to actually craft stuff with a deliberate result, you know? And then you get into that mind frame of being a, a craftsperson rather than a hobbyist. Because a craftsperson actually crafts every single day and what i would also encourage you guys to do is bring things to a finish like even if you don't have a project happening right now this is why i say like literally download a commercial from youtube and score it for like the next 30 days do that 
because you're going to get better as a result. You're going to learn how to overcome those moments when you're stuck in a loop, especially if you give yourself a deadline. Because that's the reality. Like if you're if you're like modeling, you're trying to model yourself on the people within the business who are successful. These guys are or girls are doing like a demo or two a day. So literally demo in the morning, demo in the afternoon. Could you do that for 30 days straight? I mean, if you could, then I think your craft will improve. You will have a lot more things to choose from for your reel. And also you'll learn how what your working style is. You know how to get out of the loop, when to stop, when not to stop, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Love that quote from Leonardo da Vinci that says, uh, "There are no such things as finished pieces of art, just abandoned ones." Something like that. <laughs> That's the other thing, man. Like this is why advertising is so cool in a way because you just have to ship it. I re I try to record an EP. Well, I recorded an album like 10 years ago. I took a year off of advertising. It was the worst experience I ever had because there was no deadline. There was no one standing over me. It was painful, man. It was painful. So I'm kind of glad like there's someone standing over me saying, yeah, two days to deliver something great. You know, it's like when your senses sharpen, it's like, um, yeah, it's just, it's just a cool thing. So thanks for your question, Fiona. Thank you so much for answering. Okay, Tommy, we have uh, from YouTube's uh, Mbars Berlin, who's asking about yeah. what, what's the general time frame you have between the inception and the demo? Because his, his concern is that he usually doesn't mix nor master yeah. his own music. Yeah. So, um, so if he should learn how to mix better, yeah. how, what are you expecting? What's the time frame? Yeah, I mean, the timelines, the timelines can be ridiculous. So they can be as low as the same day. We've had those where people like contact us. They're like, oh, it's not working out with our music production company. Can you send us something by the afternoon? Um, uh, to like five days. I've never seen more than five days as an average to come up with music. Usually it'll be like two, two three days. Um, Louis, you, you uh, are, are one of our success stories. You're out there, you're getting like requests for demos from music production companies. Have you seen a pattern as to how much time they give you for uh, to return a demo? Um, yeah, I would say it's between one and four days. One and four days, yeah. So I've, I've, I get this question a lot because there are people in the masterclass who say like, I do the composition, but I do do the mixing and mastering. You might not disqualify yourself that way. Um, You know, because if you're able to deliver something amazing to me in three days, however you do it, all that I care about is what comes out of the speaker. Now, the issue with not being self-reliant is, say I pick your demo, and now we have to revise it. And usually the revision time is much less. Not always, but like usually the revisions are expected like the next day. Now you got to go to your mixing engineer, your mastering engineer. She's busy. He's busy. Now you have a real problem because I just chose your demo, but we need to do something to it because the client wants it. Now we're really on the hook. And now you're telling me that you can't deliver tomorrow. That's not going to happen, you know? So there is no reason not to be self-reliant today. Like there is no reason that someone who's not a drummer can't lay down a drum track using certain tools. There's no reason why you... Um, can't be self-reliant like all of the top folks in our business are self-reliant so uh, they'll pick up the guitar they'll play piano if they have to i don't play piano that includes me i don't play the piano but i know how to input the notes and make them sound good enough for the simplistic compositions that i do that still sound you know decent so really strive to be self-reliant because that will go a long way in this business. I hope um, I can add uh, something, Tommy, uh, yeah, about, sure, about this. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I, I've been studying uh, composition uh, two, for, for the last uh, 20 years in Argentina, then in Vienna, where I live now for, uh, for the last 20 years. And I come from 
usually I, I did a lot of uh, pop music, then I studied classical music. And my problem is that I, I'm not, I'm still not good in dealing with uh, software when I have to um, put something into logic and put it in a, in a good quality. I may have some uh, good ideas, but when I put them into um, together and, and I do a mix, a mix of it, it doesn't really work. I'm not, I'm not happy what it, what it turns out of the speaker. So every yeah. time you say it, I, I say, yeah, that's where, that's where I want to go. And I hope, uh, um, then you know I'm, what you need to work on, you know? Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I, I want to say, I, uh, feel, um, it's a honor for me and a pleasure to be with musicians that work, uh, with, um, a context doing, doing music without this, um, uh, um extra philosophical thing you you uh, uh, give uh gas to the and stuff to the um, to the people who are really needing it it and uh, it's um uh, something that i need to learn a lot and i hope uh i'm in the in the right place here um we are meeting once in a week uh or or how are we meeting? No, this, uh, there's no, this is the first time that I've ever done a call with people. Okay. Okay. And there's no, uh, there's no plans right now to do a regular call, but in December, okay. we're going to chat with, uh, with uh, some of my uh, inner circle folks who are helping me out like Lucky, for instance. And we have a few others who uh, we, we want to sketch out a plan for next year. And that might include more of a membership community um, coaching slash contest kind of a setup, but it would be separate from the masterclass okay. because it's like when people join a masterclass, uh, sometimes they ask me, Oh, will there be a Facebook group? Will there be this? Will there be that? And I'm like, you know what? I don't like Facebook groups. And I don't think you need them in order to succeed. In fact, I would argue that if you just stick to the damn curriculum and do your work within the masterclass, what, like, what do you need a Facebook group for? It should be like a, like a racehorse with blinders on, just like focusing on your superpower and the, and the thing in your, but having said that, having said that, I believe the masterclass is complete as a thing that it's supposed to deliver. In other words, whoever does it religiously from like module one to, to all, even the bonus stuff and they do their homework and they reach out, they should get traction. If they're not getting traction, they need to revisit. Maybe the reel is not ready. Maybe the, you know, the website's not ready. Like you got to pivot. Uh, and I, I want to be as honest as I can with people when they send me their reels and their homework. Um, having said all of that, this is really really helpful to get together as a community once in a while to have a call like this to see each other to talk to each other you know i'm all about the human aspect i'm not about going on facebook i'm just not but what we are talking about is developing a new thing that will be and it that will be separate from the master class but it will be you guys that start this thing because that's all we got right now is like the people who join the masterclass, right? So we're going we're gonna to design and talk about this thing and uh, probably launch it in the new year. And again, it will be like a mix of these kinds of calls, some kind of coaching, bringing people in. Uh, for instance, let's say I brought in a music producer from a big production company on this call. And then we chatted. I mean, I think that would be wildly valuable. Um, and contests, you know, because, yeah, what's next after the masterclass? I'm desperate to give you guys traction. I'm not a huge music production company. So I don't, I'm okay with doing six campaigns a year. But I would love to give you more opportunities. So, uh, you know, we're talking about that also. It's like, how can we give you guys these contests these real life opportunities where may the best music win it's not about the damn connection it's not about someone kissing ass it's like i receive the demos and i pass them forward and the best demo wins and um uh yeah i mean we have our first success story which is not yet finished but 
But uh, yeah, we're working on that now and you're going to hear about it soon. So that's our plan for the new year. Beautiful. But I, uh, the last thing I say, uh, I'm, I'm behind with all uh, the, the videos have to uh, pick up. And, and, but this is, uh, to me, very, very useful to see you and, and the people who are um, um, within yeah, here. Sure. Sure. And it, uh, it motivates uh, a lot. So if there yeah. is any possibility to do this before uh, the masterclass ends, uh, I think uh, I would be very happy. Thank well, you. the masterclass never ends. So for those <laughs> okay. of you who enroll, okay. uh, it never ends. You have lifetime access. And like Lewis was saying in our interview, he literally goes back to it, even though he's now like scoring stuff in real life campaigns. He goes back to it and that's, you know, uh, so yeah, there's no time limit on the masterclass and, and that's I why see. like I built I it so that it's all self-contained. There's not, it's built so that you don't need, um, yeah, anything other than that. That's how I designed yes. it. Uh, uh, but again, uh, the community thing, I think it would be a separate thing and, um, and uh, we're talking about it, and don't be surprised if uh, if you hear more about it uh, soon. Lucky, we got Amazing. any other? We have David waiting for. David, uh, yeah. David. David, David. David Ben Porat. Um, oh, David, yeah. From, yeah. Chicago. Chicago, yeah. Here we go. Hello, you hear me? Hey, brother, how you doing? Good to see you and it's good to see everybody's faces as part of this too um it, this might be a dumb question and i, and I you kind of answered it a little bit it, it was part of like the community thing too so for me you know I, I play a lot of instruments but the one achilles heel for me is like guitar i don't play guitar and i'm wondering i've been telling myself for a few years do i need to go and learn guitar or you know obviously if there's a demo fee i could maybe hire some but like you're saying becoming self-reliant and so yeah. I don't know of any VSTs that handle guitar well, um, besides maybe like the picked thing on native instruments. But I just was curious if if you or people like I was going to do the homework this weekend with the uh, this week with the bourbon thing. And yeah. I was like, this whole thing's just guitar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was well, like, what do I do? You know, So keep in mind that in the mat, like, yeah. So keep in mind that the homework, I try to give diverse kinds of commercials to do. But, you know, uh, not every composer could do, uh, you know, the whiskey and the Mitsubishi. You know, they just can't. Like, it's too different. So don't worry too much about it. Like, um, you're going to be compete. Like, Narin studied jazz guitar. <laughs> He's a virtuoso guitar player. Like, so how long will it take you to catch up to him? Do you see exactly what I'm saying? That's my point. That's, that's, what, that's exactly, my point. Like, that's why I talk about the superpower. Like, Try to narrow in on the thing. Maybe it's that you make, uh, you know, electronic score sound good and minimal and just goosebumpy. Maybe it's that you use uh, some weird specific instrument, and so therefore vintage tracks that are hard to make with VSTs become your thing. Um, you know, that's that's really up to you to figure out. But be careful not to like put yourself in a place where it's like, Oh, I got to be a master of all trades. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you're going to be competing with folks who are highly specialized, like the Epic orchestral guy that I was telling you about. That's all he does or electronic folks. You know, it's like, don't try to be electronic if it's not in your bloodstream. So you suggest like focusing on a niche rather than like trying to, emulate an assignment or like, you know, when you get a brief or for example, when I get briefs, it's like, we're looking for songs, something like this, you know, and, yeah. and usually I can emulate a lot of that, but, and, and I hire a guitar player if there's a budget, but um, you know, I was just curious as to if you think it's probably that's better. What, that's what we keep talking about in conversations with other music producers. Like when I emailed Elijah, for instance, oh, when I talked to Elijah from Massive, um, I spoke to another uh, person also that well, I haven't published this interview yet from um, from Butter in Los Angeles. Uh, and he was saying, I want niche. Like, I, I don't want, like, give me, show me everything. I want niche. I personally, as a music producer, like to hear the whole gamut. Like, that's me. 
I don't want to hear generic tracks. I don't want to hear things that are easy to make, but I do allow for the possibility that someone who is able to make a blues track is also able to create an electronic track. And I've seen it in the homework assignments. I've seen it. I've seen people like literally being able to do both, but just keep in mind that that's not, uh, I'll give you an example. There's another duo in the Netherlands. They do a lot of work, these guys, a lot of work. They're doing really, really well. Two freelance composers that are a team. They're certainly not known for playing any live instruments, but guess what? Like when you send them an electronic brief, it's amazing. When you send them an orchestral brief, even it's like, wow, I didn't know they could do that. But like they're masters at their tools. They're able to use VSTs to, you know, get that commercial sound, that goosebumpy thing happening. So, you know, it's really, you know, and you're going to learn over time what your superpower is as it relates to this business. Also, you know, that's an ongoing process, you know. Thank you. Thanks, David. Tommy, do you have time for one more or how? Let's do, uh, yeah, let's do like three more and okay. see, you know, try to kind of pick the questions that you feel will resonate with most people instead of being like, you know. Yeah. Um, so we have here uh, on YouTube, uh, someone asking uh, Brianna Keys uh, about if someone who's exclusively like a singer songwriter, if they can be successful in, in, in our business? Yeah. I mean, it all depends on what, uh, kind of songs you sing, <laughs> um, because it's always a matter of connecting with what the market needs, right? So what kind of commercials are being done with songs and what kind of singing do you hear there? But, uh, yeah, I can tell you that there are singer songwriters who are making a good living from commercials. They're not making a great living right now from their artistic career, from their albums and their touring. But um, because they've kind of entrenched themselves within a few music production companies as the kind of folks who can write a difficult to write song that still fits the commercial, they're getting the brief. So you can definitely do it. You can do both. In fact, I would say that um, um, if you're a singer songwriter, I would encourage you to do both. Why am I saying that? Because when I hire somebody to create a song, I want it to sound like it came from an artist and not like it came from a, someone who does advertising jingles. I want the soul. I want yeah. the depth, but I want it matched the picture. So that skill is very important. Okay. We also have a question. Uh, someone asking if uh, are not producers already like oversaturated with composers or, or yeah that's a very good space question. for there is a i mean there is a lot of musicians out there because the tools have been made available to everybody yes there is a lot of competition there is a lot of competition but you wouldn't believe how many people do it the wrong way You wouldn't believe how many musicians don't know how to email. You wouldn't believe how many musicians don't know how to communicate. You wouldn't believe how many musicians are unreliable. And I still believe that a remarkable craftsperson, someone who shows up on time, who doesn't give up, who keeps emailing the right way, who keeps focusing on people and not projects, who keeps developing relationships, who keeps working at their craft, they're a minority. They're a minority. So like, yes, there are a lot of musicians out there today, but really like how many remarkable musicians are out there? And that should really be your goal. Like that's the standard you should aim for, you know? Also, the next thing I want to say is that not everybody is meant to be a composer in this business. Don't let that discourage you because based on your prior working experience, your education or your skill set, You might find yourself in this business doing something other than freelance composing. Look at me. <laughs> I'm a music producer with no music background, a former banker, you know. But where is my superpower? Communication, musical taste, 
ability to have one foot in the world of art and one foot in the world of business. I'm trying to like, I feel like there is no other place for me. I'm at the right intersection, right in between a studio and a boardroom. So for many of you watching, you might decide, hey, maybe I could be a music supervisor in this business. Maybe I could be a music producer in this business. There's various roles, you know, in the business. So, so just remember that, that uh, it, you might find yourself in a different place than what you expected, you know, in the end. But uh, that doesn't change the fact that the business is vast. Billions are being spent. Countless pieces of content are being made right now that need music. Countless. So it's a great question for me. Is the amount of musicians bigger than the amount of opportunities? I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. I think there's a lot of opportunities today. And if you want a refresher, look at the part one of the mini class. There are people who are right now working on the sound design of the car interior at Volvo. Like who, like you don't see that on LinkedIn every day, but it exists. So it's a matter of like really opening your eyes and yeah, there's going to always be competition, but the cream rises to the top. And in this world is more than ever opportunities where sound crafted intentionally and music is needed. So keep that in mind everywhere and always. Amazing. One more question, Lucky. And we then, have uh, Pascale, who I think yeah. can unmute. Um, Thanks, David. See you, man. Pascale. Uh, yeah, I'm asking to unmute. If not, he, he said basically, how would you, if you're creating so many demos throughout your, like your, once you start rolling, I guess, like how would you effectively organize your your library or like if there's any advice. Great question. That. Because uh, maybe I, maybe a project arises, I, I'm thinking like yes. in a few years and you yes. already composed something that was not yes. successful. How would you? And that's a very good question and a very relevant question. Why is this? Because a lot of top composers in our business are often now being asked for archives because there are very quick projects that are happening for social media, let's say, that might not have the budget of a big campaign. But the brand or the music production company is offering to license your track non-exclusive, which means that you could still keep shopping your track to other places. You're just looking for the right fitting track and maybe they have a thousand bucks to give you for it, you know, something like that. So I find that more and more this is happening where these quick jobs are happening. So the bigger library you have, the better. And that's why I say to you, like download 30, 60, 90 commercials, just keep crafting every day to improve your craft, but also to build your library. And the tools that uh, have been recommended to me by top guys in the business um, are things like Disco. So Disco is a playlist creator of sorts that allows you to tag and organize your music and then quickly search for it. And apparently it has all sorts of like fancy functionality. I haven't tried it yet, but we are going to implement this in our music production company to manage our archives. So look it up. It's disco dot AC, I think. Yeah. It's AC. from Australia, I think. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. And look into services like it, but, um, but yeah, craft music daily. Um, if it's, you know, Re relevant is if, if it's resonating with the commercial world because you're scoring commercials let's say you know you're not posting them but you're scoring to them you're going to build up a nice piece of music and then what might happen is like you're emailing and then suddenly someone says out of the blue um you know they listen to your stuff and they go do you have any more stuff like this because i'm actually working right now on something and i need and then you, you search for your stuff and you send them like five tracks. Yeah, here you go, five. And then, you know, that's how it starts because then I'm like, oh, wow. Like they were responsive. They replied to me right away. They sent me tracks in really good taste. 
even if it doesn't make it that time, I'm always going to keep you in mind. So be ready for that, you know, be ready for, for that opportunity. So, uh, yeah, 10 o'clock. I think that's it. I think we should call, man, like who's going to, you know, we're going to put this on YouTube two hours hours again. (laughs) I'm like, you know what, in a way though, I'm kind of glad that these things are long because uh, it's the same reason why we didn't have like a support Facebook group in the masterclass. It's almost like, I want to see who are the soldiers, you know, who's still able to like deliver the homework without like, you know, having to get together on a call every week. Um, so these long videos on YouTube, um, it's a way of filtering people out. Let's face it. Like there is no way. And now you guys know this cause you're part of the masterclass. You've seen how much content there is in there. There's no way to like try to create remarkable craftspeople with these shallow and simple three easy tips. I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, in the past, apprentices used to study under masters for like years, you know. Well, how is this different? We're we're trying to be remarkable craftspeople, you know. We're trying to create music at a world-class level. That's why I say it's a marathon. It's not going to be a three-month master class. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a long time, you know. For some, it will be short. For some, it will be long. But, yeah, it's not an overnight sort of a thing. So, so guys, we're going to, I think, wrap it up. I really well, hope that this Tell me, I want to thank you for all this information that you're putting out. I appreciate it. I really, uh, really get it inspired by all the videos and all the information in the master class I'm, I'm still active i'm you know i'm, I'm i haven't sent much more um, of the of the homework for because family and all that stuff but of course, it, I, it, I always i'm always connected to it watching it and taking notes and, and it has helped me a lot so i want to thank you really appreciate that. it man yeah really appreciate it really appreciate really appreciate all of you guys like uh I want to tell you guys that every single person that enrolls in the masterclass, I, you know, I send a welcome email and it means a lot to me because I know this is a different context. You know, when we're sending an invoice for thousands of dollars to some brand, I don't really care. I'm not very sensitive to the financial situation of the brand, but I am quite sensitive to the fact that uh, everyone that joins this thing is a human being. Uh, It's not, uh, you know, it's not cheap to enroll in the masterclass. In fact, it's going to get even more expensive in December, a lot more expensive because I've been talking to students. I've been talking to peers in the business and they're like, this thing is way too cheap um, for what it's offering. So I don't know if we have any people left on YouTube, but, you know, we, we are actually, um, we have a Black Friday offer now. This this will be the lowest that you can get in to the master class ever. Because in December, like I said, after Black Friday, uh, it's going to be priced at least double of the webinar special that we had for most of you who joined. It's going to be at least double. Uh, the regular price is actually going to be triple. So, And this is also a way of weeding people out. I want high quality people here. I feel like uh, we have that to a certain degree. Most of you guys showing up here, it's a good family, good DNA, smart folks, enthusiastic folks, thoughtful people. That's the kind of folks I want, you know, um, uh, in the family. In fact, I mean, that's the kind of people I want coming out of this academy because I also have a reputation to protect. So, so, so yeah, um, for you guys, um, really a lot of gratitude. Thank you so much for the trust. You had no idea what you were signing up for when you signed up. Maybe you did, but uh, now you definitely know uh, what you signed up for. And uh, just know that in December, when Black Friday's over, we're going to give some serious thoughts to like what's next. Um, in addition to the masterclass so that we can do these kinds of things, build a community, be in contact, 
and I can be of service along the way, maybe by bringing other people in to do interviews with, maybe do portfolio review sessions with industry professionals. So you hear it from them and not just me. And also contests. That's going to be a big focus. Um, more opportunities for you guys to actually test your skills. Um, that's it, guys. Really, thank you for hanging on. This was a long call, but uh, really appreciate you guys. Um, and uh, any parting words of wisdom? Anybody need to really say something <laughs> before we end? I don't want to cut anybody off if you're really itching to say something. Grateful to Am be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Matthias. You, you need to get some sleep because you're going to be <laughs> up at 5 a.m. tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to bed right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to try to get a roof over your head because it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stay safe. Okay, everybody. Big hugs to you all. Thank uh, you. Really big hugs to you all. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Really appreciate you all. And um, we'll talk to you soon, guys. All the best. I don't even know how you end one of these things, but there's a first time for everything. Take care, guys. Big hugs to everybody, all right? Thanks, man. Right. Bye.